Hello, and thank you for tuning in today. I am Anthony Gustin, and today we're going to be talking about Beyond Seed Oils, where you can find linoleic acid in our food system, and a little bit why you should be aware of it and why you should remove it, and then what you can do about it. So super excited to be presenting today among a bunch of other amazing people that, you know, this started for me as a sort of a fringe obsession about seven, eight years ago when I was digging into my clinic I'm trying to figure out what was causing a lot of the health problems that I was seeing. And seed oils were a huge problem. We'll get into that in a second, uh, sort of what I saw clinically. But yeah, to, to see everything kind of come together and having all of the amazing people who have done tremendous work over the last, you know, for some people, decades to try to push this agenda forward. I'm just super grateful to have, you know, been part of this effort to coordinate people and, and talk about this issue. I think that vegetable oil, seed oils, linoleic acid, all that stuff will probably be known as the next trans fat within, you know, if it's five years, 50 years, I mean, to see the tide shift, it's, it's very clear and unequivocal for me that this is a huge problem. And, you know, just grateful that you are attending and able to soak in some of this information and hopefully we can provide you enough compelling reasons to also think that this is a huge problem that you should be paying attention to and, and spreading the word up. So again, thank you for tuning in. I know that this is a lot of really intense information. So stick it out. Hopefully we can make it fun and you can learn some stuff. So who am I? My name is Anthony. Um, I am trained as a chiropractor. So I have my doctorate in chiropractic masters in sports rehab. I left grad school about 10 years ago at this point. Wow. Getting old. Um, and focused in the beginning on sports medicine. So with a chiropractic degree, I was very focused on musculoskeletal system and helping people get out of physical pain. Um, so did that for a while, got a lot of um, great progress, um, wasn't doing much of adjusting. So a lot of people think that chiropractors just basically crack people's backs and, and go on with it. But scope of practice is way more broad. Some schools still teach that, but most don't. It's more evidence-based. Again, looking at the musculoskeletal system, nervous system, and trying to get everything to work appropriately so that people can move and feel good. Ordered a bunch of pro athletes and all the way down to just random desk jockeys and got, I have to say, it got kind of boring pretty quickly. It's, a, it's pretty easy to get people out of physical pain. There's only so many things that can go wrong. You have acute injuries or chronic injuries and it, how to fix those is pretty, actually pretty easy. Um, so soon after that, you know, started resolving people's physical pain. They had complaints about other, you know, health issues, whether it's skin issues, obesity, metabolic um, problems, sometimes cancer, things like that. So shifted a lot of my practice to a functional medicine model within about three years after I graduated. And functional medicine, if people aren't aware, is more of the slants on how to get people well. You know, you use labs, use a lot of things, but looking at the system of biology holistically and trying to get to the root cause of the issues people have, again, you know, whether it's skin issues, obesity, metabolic, you know, dysfunction, any of these things, Western medicine tends to treat things in, in a really strict vacuum. And that leads to a lot of, you know, whack-a-mole and putting out symptoms instead of actually looking at what the root cause is. So started focusing a lot of that. And uh, obviously nutrition has been a big part of, you know, if anybody sort of takes health seriously, they understand like what a big lever that is. But I mean, even when we were dealing with, with sports medicine patients in our clinic, we just noticed that what a huge lever from pro athletes all the way down to the weekend warriors modifying the diet would have. And, and then way more so when we looked into the functional medicine stuff. So when people had more systemic issues going on, the nutrition piece was so, so, so important. So one of the biggest things that I saw was people's inability to process and handle glucose. And so this has sort of led me down to the fascination of ketogenic diet, removing carbs, titrating carbohydrates, using that a lot in my clinic for people with either performance um, or even looking into, again, reversing some of these chronic diseases. However, going deeper and deeper, you know, you, you'd find people who would be able to eat a large amount of carbohydrates and have no issues with it. Also just studying ancestral populations, we have a lot of examples of people having uh, a, a large amount of carbohydrates yet not having any issues metabolizing them. So that got me thinking more and more of, you know, what's the actual problem? I think I had had for in the last 15 plus years, this heuristic of if it comes from a factory, probably not great um, and sort of ditching out. I mean, people like Rob Wolf and, and others have been talking about the issue of omega-6 fatty acid ratios, things like that for a really, really long time. 
but didn't understand the severity and how much of a primary driver seed oils, linoleic acid, this omega-6 fatty acid uh, actually is in our diet and how that can impact us. So started dealing, you know, modifying a little bit more. When people are just going keto, sometimes they didn't have a lot of results. Started pulling and really focusing on the quality of the fats and not just seed oils, a lot of these other things that we'll talk about today. And once we started to get to that lever, people would have, you know, sort of miraculous results, especially even if they were pulling with a carbohydrate. So, you know, this could be a, a, another entire presentation, but my point of view now, especially after all my clinical practice and dealing with people a lot afterwards has been, if you remove the seed oils, you'll likely fix a lot of the issues why you can't have carbohydrates in the first place. But sometimes if you've gone too far, you're going to need to remove the carbs and the seed oils and then sort of see if your metabolism can get back to normal and add the carbs back in. But the, the problem of, of low carb is actually a problem of uh, high seed oils, high linoleic acid in my mind. So anyway, once we started figuring that out, um, I lived in San Francisco, I had my clinics there and I realized what the internet was and started posting a lot of stuff. I had a little bit of a following take off and then started solving problems for people online with businesses. Um, and that's kind of like led, led me to where I'm at now. So I no longer practice and I have sort of this bifocal approach where, you know, still care so much about nutrition and our food system. And I've gotten way more into sustainability and um, ecosystem health, planetary health. So I think that how we treat our land is is sort of the result ends up with how we treat our bodies and what our what our human health looks like. So have a small farm here outside of Austin, Texas, and doing a lot there to learn about the food system and how we actually grow healthy food in a sustainable way. But the other side of that, I have done some companies, which we'll, we'll talk about in the next slide, but trying to think about how we can use businesses as a way to incentivize people to make change at, at a greater scale. I did some math when I was in my clinic and realized that we're not going to have much change when we just look at treating people one-on-one, -on -one, which is totally necessary. And I think there's a place for it, but I think that a lot of these problems are huge and need a little bit more intention just than the one-on-one -on -one, uh, care. So what I'm doing now, here are some disclosures. So these are just some of the, I'm a pretty busy guy. I have been having a really crazy last five, six years since I've been out of my clinic. So these are some of the things that I just wanted to disclose. So that way you have some insight into what I'm doing. So I have a bunch of different businesses. Again, I think that's the biggest tool to help people make change. So some of them here are listed on the left, one zero acre farms, which we're trying to solve this problem of seed oils in the food industry. Um, perfect keto, helping people get off of um, carbohydrates in a, in a healthy way. So if they want to fix their metabolism, they can do that. And then a couple other companies as well. Um, get also an investor in a bunch of health companies. So I am keen on supporting with, you know, with capital and with, you know, an advisorship to some of these other companies. There are more of these companies. They're not as much in the health space. So if you want a full list, feel free to reach out and I'm happy to provide them nothing to hide from me. Yeah. And then something I learned from Nina when she did her presentation is she discloses her dietary philosophy, which I think is actually pretty important when you're talking about anything with nutrition. Um, everyone has their biases. I'm not immune to that as well. I'm full of them like any other human. And I think that disclosing that's super important. So my dietary philosophy personally is eating a bunch of nutrient dense local foods. And so for me, that looks like hunting a good majority of my meat here in Texas uh, and just trying to basically eat whatever is local and seasonal from small farms. I think that there's a variety of reasons why this is good and we don't need to get into that, but I eat animal products. I don't eat a lot of processed food. Um, and I can sort of touch on my own opinions on how I approach food and eating throughout here. Cause I think it might be relevant to people to discover how they can modify their food choices given the information we're about to go over. So that's my dietary philosophy. I'm not dogmatic about it. I think that if people want to eat vegan, that's great. If they want to eat carnivore, that's fine. I think that food freedom is the most important thing. So people should be able to choose which foods that they're eating and not be restricted. Overall, I think Foods that spoil are generally better than foods that that don't, but uh, that is my nutritional um, philosophy. Okay, so if you're here, you probably know that or think or at least have been influenced somewhat that seed oils, aka vegetable oils, are not great. So there's a lot of reasons for this, and a lot of the other people at the conference will be able to dive into a lot of the mechanisms and why and history and all this other stuff. So this will just be a short little recap here, but... The two big things are this, that they're terrible for our health and they're terrible for the plant's health. So I have some stats here that are pretty alarming. Um, the increased risk of death by 62% more than moderate smoking is it's pretty shocking. Um, 
linked to pretty much every single chronic disease. Uh, I don't, it, it's, it sucks. I don't want it to seem like a panacea. Like this is removing it will fix all of our problems. I think it, you know, there are many, many drivers in uh, human health that lead to problems. And I think that there are in times for each individual primary drivers. And I think this seed oil is in the, the amount, and we'll talk to you about in a second, the linoleic acid is linked to a vast variety of them, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, infertility, neurodegenerative disease, neurodegenerative disease inflammation, and more like we have here. Um, and they're just truly awful and completely unsustainable for the planet. And there's a lot of talk about you know people thinking that they're, are issues with animal agriculture. And I think that if animal agriculture is done in an industrial way, it can certainly be bad, but there are at least models for animal agriculture that provide food in not only a sustainable way, but a regenerative way where if you manage the animals appropriately, you can actually restore ecosystems, pull carbon into the soil, improve biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas growing these enormous monocrops of seed oils um, you see the stats here. Four of the top five greenhouse gas emitting crops are seed oil crops. And actually the, the the remaining one is actually rice, which a lot of the rice brand goes to making rice brand oil. So actually, I think five of the top five green, greenhouse gas emitting crops are seed oils and terrible. Uh, two of the top three drivers of deforestation. And if you've ever seen like an enormous combine ripping through a monocrop field, this is the least sustainable thing possible. So you get these huge combines rolling through. They absolutely decimate any sort of life. They destroy the waterways. You have to spray them with herbicides, pesticides, etc. You have soil erosion. You have loss of biodiversity. You have loss of soil carbon. You have annual plants that need to be ripped up and tilled every year. It, it is a ridiculously inefficient and unsustainable way to grow food, um, which is, just a, again, this is the stuff that I'm into. So a little bit of a tangent from what we're talking about in this specific talk, but just, I think an important note, um, to know about, you know, how this stuff is grown. Okay. So what makes seed oils so bad? Again, other people at this conference will be able to drill into this stuff and give you guys a little bit more context specifically, but I figured it would be good to highlight some of this stuff. So anything in nature, you know, it's, it's probably not going to kill you, but it's generally the amount that is problematic. So in this case, linoleic acid, which we'll get to in the next slide, we're eating way too much of it. And historically speaking, this is totally fine, but you can even die from drinking too much water. So anything in excess is not great for the human body. Uh, but what is linoleic acid? So linoleic acid is just a fatty acid. It's an omega-6 fatty acid. So here it's the it's an 18 carbon, um, two saturated, um, two double bonds here. So those are at the nine and the 12 position. And this specific fatty acid has been linked to a lot of problems. So have some quotes here. We can run through them. Uh, and for all of the um, studies I have here linked, I have them in an asterisk form. So you can just click through. So if you're interested in getting the slides here, just reach out to me. I have a contact page at the end of the presentation and I'm happy to send them over so you can have all the references yourself. It's just a cleaner way to do it. So heart disease, we'll just read this out. Oxidized linoleic acid metabolites can induce direct toxic effects to the endothelium, such as inflammation, reactive oxygen species, and adhesion molecules leading to atherosclerosis. Not great. Uh, linoleic acid also linked to obesity. So increasing linoleic acid from 1% of nutrition to 8% of nutrition. Uh, again, which is all about the amount here. Elevated the arachidonic acid to phospholipids in liver. Triple 2AG, 1AG, and Tucker Goodrich will talk a lot about that, I'm sure, with a lot of what he's going over and AEA associated with increased food intake, feed efficiency, and adiposity in mice. So essentially, linoleic acid gives you the munchies and causes you to overeat. Uh, cancer, so our findings suggest that dietary linoleic acid impacts multiple steps in cancer invasion and angiogenesis, and that reducing linoleic acid on the diet may help slow cancer progression. Metabolic health and inflammation, so ox lambs, oxidative, Linoleic acid metabolites, which we'll talk about in a second here as well, contribute to NASH development, which is essentially fatty liver, including mitochondrial dysfunction, hepat hepatocyte cell death, and um, NLRP3 inflammasome activation. Vascular health, so high linoleic acid diet, increased oxidative stress, stress and affected endothelial function in a way which may, in the long term, predispose to endothelial dysfunction, which again lead to heart disease, stroke, etc. So... This again is just a very, very brief um, overview. 
I truly think at this point, if anyone is not convinced of the problem of excess linoleic acid, just, just hasn't read the literature. So another point down here, the produces, what are these other things? So four hydroxy, no, 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 nine hold, 13 hold, et cetera. Linoleic acid in excess has dozens, if not hundreds of toxic metabolites that it produces. Again, oxidative linoleic acid metabolites here. Um, there are entire journal issues and scientific journals that are dedicated to looking into the problems of some of these metabolites. Again, if, if people aren't convinced that this is a problem, I just don't think that they've been abreast at the latest research. I, it's almost impossible to stay up on it. So I'm not judging anybody, but I'd say like, keep an open mind. And there's a lot of people again, who are speaking at this conference who have done a tremendous amount of work in the last 20 plus years, but it, it's not a secret. And again, that's why I think that this is going to be the next trans fat. The, the information's out there. It's just the ability to, to really pull the dots to, together and connect them and then present them in, a, in an effective way is something that I think is happening now. And so hopefully this conference is a good point of that. But yeah, linoleic acid, not good in excess. And so again, what does excess mean? So here's a couple of things that are important to note. So we can test fatty acid levels of people to know, okay, has linoleic acid increased? So the consumption has increased a remarkable degree. So this paper from Stephen Gay and A shows a couple different graphs here. One of them is showing linoleic acid percentage in adipose tissue over time. So he starts at like the high single digit percents from the 1950s, which is the, the earliest uh, research that he was able to pull together in this review, all the way up to 20 plus percent. And I think 2005 was the last year that they looked. So obviously keep trending that out. Things are going to keep increasing and keep increasing. So why is this the case? Because we're eating way more of it. So I don't have any charts on this and the history of vegetable oils and, and other places. You just, just search the amount basically since 1911 has gone through the roof at an exponential rate. Um, and this here shows that as we increase the linoleic acid intake, the percentage of linoleic acid in our adipose tissue also goes up. So you eat more linoleic acid you store more linoleic acid. And the problem here with linoleic acid that I think is worth pointing out is that with other foods that I don't think humans should be eating tons of, processed sugar, even refined grains, things like that, your body sort of gets rid of them relatively quickly. With sugar, you, your body is done reacting to it within a couple of hours. Refined grains can have some gut damage, things like that, some intestinal permeability, brain, you know, blood brain barrier, things like that, issues that, you know, week or so, totally fine. The half-life of linoleic acid in your fat tissue alone is almost two years. So every time you eat a meal with, with excess amount of linoleic acid, in it, your body will store it in your fat for about two years. For your nervous tissue, I've seen studies that show up to five years. And so the point about that is that we can bioaccumulate this, this fatty acid. So that's what makes linoleic acid so tough is that if you are producing all these toxic metabolites and you eat all of this food, you're storing it and you, you, you basically retain the ability to release all of this, uh, all these toxic metabolites and the molecule can actually auto oxidize in the body when it's in the phospholipid membranes and all these different areas. So not good. You do not want this part of your tissue and this, this ab availability to bioaccumulate is what makes this, what in my opinion, one of the worst things that we can overconsume because you can't get rid of it if you overconsume it for two years. Uh, what's normal? An ice age man tested at about 2.3% linoleic acid. So we'll get into this in a little bit, but animal agriculture and other plants that I think humans should be eating in a, in a reasonable, amount, a reasonable amount actually reflect this. So about, you know, low single digits, certainly under about 5%, it seems to be, is about the normal amount of linoleic acid for humans to eat, but also looks like, again, what we should be storing in our tissues. So again, when, when Gaine first started looking at this in the fifties, you know, late fifties, early sixties, we we're already up close to 10, 10%. So we were already five times the amount that we should have been looking like, because again, seed oil consumption started in the early 1900s. Modern humans, again, at this chart, were 10, over 10 times in some cases, the amount of linoleic acid stored in our tissues. This isn't even just what we're eating. We'll get to that in a second, but stored in our tissues. So we are made up of 10 times more of this linoleic acid than is species appropriate. Not great. Um, another thing that 
people typically point to is that in the past hunter gatherer diets, things like this ratio between omega six fatty acids and omega three fatty acids used to be under one. So 0.79 and is now over 20 to one. So not good. I mean, I think that ratio is overblown a little bit. And I think that a lot of the problems actually stem from just the sheer amount of linoleic acid consumed, but it's just a, it goes to show how much, even if we kept omega three levels stable, how much more we're eating in linoleic acid than we used to. So if, when things change in biology and in, in complex systems, this amount, when you, when you're talking about, you know, factors, you're talking about, you know, the fatty acid profile going from two to 20% ratios from 0.7 to 20 to one, you know, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? You, you, you change a biological sense, system that has been operating for hundreds of thousands of years, things are going to happen. And so obviously we're talking about chronic disease, all that type of stuff. So, um, where do you find the linoleic acid? It's pretty um, clear that the seed oils are the biggest offenders of uh, linoleic acid consumption. So if you look at, oops, if you look at here, this chart on the right, I pulled together, these oils are pure fat. And so what you're getting this, this percentage of linoleic acid is the percentage of the fat, but the oils are just fat. And so you're looking at 70 plus percent of these oils contain linoleic acid. Okay. So some of them change. So you see like, you know, obviously here are some common ones, sunflower, safflower, soybean, corn, cottonseed, canola, grapeseed, and even avocado and olive oil. So olive oil has been shown to be, you know, 12 to 28% avocado, 18%. And so again, with the human consumption should be around you know, it's low single digits. If you're eating avocado oil and olive oil, even, which by the way, Selena Wang presenting on the adulteration. A lot of times when you get avocado and olive oil, this is actually soybean oil or rancid. So problems there. And we, we can talk about that in a, you know, another presentation, but um, really important to note how much of this you're getting. So if, if, if the species appropriate amount is low single digits and you're getting 18% and this is what you're most of your fats, you know, you're pouring, even if you're trying to be healthy using avocado, olive oil, et cetera, you know, hopefully not tons of seed oils. If you're not eating a massive amount of saturated fat, again, even that ratio, you're, you're getting a pretty good amount of these unstable linoleic acid uh, metabolites and the omega-6 fatty acids. 21% of our daily calories come from seed oils. This is such an alarming stat. So the issue with this is that, and, and uh, just as a, as a note, before we go further, 21% of dairy, daily calories just from seed oils. And so if you're looking at maybe the, the average seed oil is, you know, 50% linoleic acid, that means 10% of our daily calories are coming from linoleic acid via seed oils alone. This is just seed oils. So this is not any other food source. So 10% of the average American daily consumption of calories is just from seed oils, just from linoleic acid is ridiculous. So why are they so pervasive? They're cheap, they're easy to make, and they can be basically fillers in most foods. So you'll find them nearly every single place that packaged food is. So any sort of mayo, dressings, packaged food, almost every single plant-based option of, you know, Impossible Beyond, Oatly, et cetera, are all based upon these oils. Not great. I think one of the biggest offenders that people don't talk about is restaurants, you essentially cannot eat out period without getting blasted with seed oils in almost every single dish. I went out to a place recently in Austin, uh, it's like this new trendy little cafe spot. I could not order a single thing on the menu, a single thing without seed oils. I asked them to grill me a steak. No nope, pre-marinated seed oils. I asked them to do eggs. Nope, they refuse to cook without fat and they only have the seed oils. It is insane how pervasive this stuff is. If you go out to eat, almost every single meal you're getting walloped with seed oils. Uh, so I, I know of maybe three restaurants in the entirety of the United States, which is about a million restaurants that don't use seed oils in every single thing they cook. Even if they say they're cooking with olive oil, 
you basically in a culinary setting you need to have cheap olive oil that also is liquid when you refrigerate it so if they make dressings and sauces it stays liquid they make like a caesar dressing for example and if they refrigerate actual olive oil it'll harden and you can't put it in a salad and so every olive oil restaurant is canola olive oil blend regardless getting off a little bit of a tangent here the most important thing is that check food labels and ask at restaurants even if you go to the healthiest restaurant you think they're crushing you with seed oils you know the, the best thing that i've seen to do and we can talk about this a little bit later about strategies to avoid this stuff is going somewhere and, and asking them again just to grill a meat or something like that or bake it even still like every sauce the marinade everything has seed oils it is crazy again so this is just from seed oils but where else do you find linoleic acid i mean this is i think one of the most important things that people don't realize is just because we're avoiding seed oils doesn't mean we're in the clear so again depends on how much fat you're getting if you're only eating five grams of fat in a day you know i don't think it's that big of a deal but i think that with the emergence of keto and people you know hopefully not being afraid of fat and again nina tai schultz who i mentioned earlier her um all all of her work has been done into helping normalize fat and again i think that you know time reversed its cover we're on the way out of the fat phobia uh, phase which is great and with that People are smashing nuts. They're smashing seeds. They're eating a lot of foods that I think are still super, super high in linoleic acid. And again, when I was talking earlier about the results I was having with patients, like we, we would sort of put them on like a real food, quote unquote, paleo-ish diet. And they would see a lot of results with a lot of their issues nutritionally. But it wasn't until we nailed down and again, thought through this whole issue of like, what could be contributing to this? Okay, linoleic acid, all right, where is that? That we came to um, these recommendations and sort of this categorization. So where else do you find linoleic acid in high amounts? Um, I think it's normal to ask, okay, if it's natural, like shouldn't I be able to eat it? Like why would nature make a food that kills me? I mean, that's sort of the argument that I have around saturated fat and our consumption of saturated fat. Like, why would nature make a food that kills us? Well, I think there's two ways to look at this. So. Other than cutting out the processed seed oils, there's there's two main groups. One is what I call the seasonal hibernation foods, which are nuts, seeds, and grains, which we'll get into. And then number two would be farmed animal products, or what I call human-fed animal products. And these are, you know, we'll drive into some nuance, but monogastrics and farmed fish especially. Uh, so we'll note here as we dive in, 97% of animal feed, 97% is uh, of uh, soybean meal is used for animal feed, which is insane. So this is the type of stuff where, again, we saw the soybean oil, super, super high in linoleic acid. Um, so we'll see how that impacts animals in just a second. So the first group, seasonal hibernation foods. Okay, so nuts, seeds, um, grains, etc. I have a little chart here on the left that talks about the percentage of linoleic acid in these foods. And so this is by total fat so i think that's important to call out so isn't this food has this amount so obviously seed oils are the worst so but for example nuts are super super high in fat and so when you're talking about like total fat consumption i think it's important that's why i broke it up this way because this is percentage of total fat consumption a lot of times people under eat fat and so if they for example are plant-based etc they try to get a lot of their fat from these sources and this is why i think people are still having a lot of problems even, even when they go paleo, plant-based, et cetera, because they're not looking at these sources. So they try to get a lot of them, you know, if they get oils, we saw the problem there, but if they get real food sources, um, you see here, walnuts, 39% linoleic acid, wheat, 58%. Oh, it's 43%. Yeah. They're not that fatty foods, but still, again, if you're eating low fat, then it does matter. Um, seeds, et cetera. Okay. So again, why is nature making foods with things that give us this inflammation, obesity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, these foods are set to be consumed at fall time. So if you see here, this fat little squirrel, that's what nature wants. So these animals have co-evolved with these food sources. At the end of the year, these things drop down from trees they're a pain in the ass to get to you see obviously what a walnut looks like before you crack into it small amounts of linoleic acid seasonally 
would have likely led to an extreme evolutionary advantage. So if Brad Marshall, Tucker Goodrich, Peter Dubomilski will talk a lot about this as well around how the seed oils will lead to a little bit of a transient inflammation in fat storage. That is great if you are trying to survive a winter with food scarcity. You want metabolic rate reduction. And again, Brad Marshall, excellent source in here. He talks a lot about how linoleic acid, the mechanisms behind it, lead to a state of torpor, which is essentially hibernation. So when you eat a lot of linoleic acid, you actually start down-regulating your metabolism. You put your metabolism in a state of slowness again, which makes sense seasonally. If this stuff is seasonal and you only eat a short time before winter, that makes sense. We also can see this, which is not mapped out here, but as far as latitudes, the more Northern you get in the latitudes, the higher the foods get in linoleic acid. So there's a, a variety of reasons for that. One of them is the plants as they get colder actually need more polyunsaturated fats. So that way the plant metabolism can work without it getting frozen. Also animals and mammals that would likely eat those plants need to get fatter because food is more scarce and they need to put on weight to burn through and keep warm through the winter time. Okay. So small amounts of nuts, seeds, and grains likely would have been totally fine for animals and likely even humans to put on a little bit of extra fat going into winter because food is going to be scarce. The issue we have now is that we are absolutely loading ourselves with handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of what otherwise would be sort of a scarce resource and a seasonal one to get fat. And I can put it here, we now eat for a winter that never comes. And so we're just eating this all of the time. And so of course, as this stuff, you know, we showed before this chart, uh, this linear chart of the more you eat, the more you store. If you're eating for a month, a year, some linoleic acid and then not eating much over the winter time, it's probably fine. You're going into pulse style fashion up and down, up and down. But when you consume vast amounts of this stuff indefinitely, nonstop, huge issues. And so again, clinically, just to bring it back to what I've seen there, pull the paleo diet, people feel great. They get some progress, but still get stuck a lot of times with, you know, ability to process carbohydrates, weight loss, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. You pull out the nuts, you pull out the seeds, which are, you know, still quote unquote paleo approved. The wheat's probably already out. The oats are probably out. The grains are probably out for a variety of other reasons. And people feel so much better. All their problems progress and they start getting to the point that they want to get to. So again, anecdotally in a clinic setting, I've seen that. I, I don't think it's just from um, caloric reasons. It's a lot of the times we have been measuring people's calories to make sure that they are constant and will take out a bunch of nuts, but then add in a lot of, coconut butter, butter, tallow, ghee, et cetera, to replace those calorie sources. And so, no, this is not an RCT, but yes, I dealt with people a lot looking at this data and trying to control for caloric intake just to remove that as a variable, but also make sure they have enough energy. A lot of times when people are eating more real food diets, they get too little food, especially when their metabolism, metabolism is broken. So try to correct for that. And still people found an enormous amount of benefit doing so. Um, I have good news for you macadamia nuts are great. So there are a few nuts outliers that, um, have actually appropriate single digit percentages, um, mostly the tropical nuts, but your macadamia nuts specifically are good to go. So they're not on this list. So I know all the people who love their Mac nuts enjoy. Okay. So that's seasonal hibernation foods. Um, again, we'll, we'll talk later on about how you should think about this if at all. Um, but this is, I think, a really important point to get across is that seasonally, they probably made sense um, for stacking on fat for the winter time. Okay, now on to human fed animals. So pork, huge, huge issue. So we're looking at here pork. This is in China. Um, Chinese people eat a lot of pork. It's increasing. The amount of consumption in pork is absolutely, absolutely skyrocketing. Same with poultry, which we'll see in a second. Uh, and lo and behold, here's what happens with pork. So species appropriate levels, 2%. The same with humans should be around 2%, but because we feed them soy, corn, etc., nonstop, they now have fat, especially factory farm pork over 30% of their fatty acids 
are uh, the are linoleic acid. So like we saw earlier in the other chart, a lot of the vegetable and seed oils are about at this range. So I put here lard and bacon can be worse than seed oils from a uh, linoleic acid perspective. Not great. When you put the, the pigs on pasture, great. We have a reduction here, generally speaking, because they have more access to free range, stuff like that. However, and this is the thing that people don't understand about farming, regenerative egg, things like that. There, there will be outfits that say, okay, pasture raised pork, pasture raised poultry. We say here, pasture raised. But they'll end up still having to get the animal to wait very quickly. And so they'll still feed the animals corn and soy. So even though they're out on pasture, they will be given feed. And just like when humans, you know, if humans go from living in a condo in New York City, never seeing sunlight to living out on, you know, a big open pasture, or living on a beach and, and like, yeah, that'll be great. It's a step up for a variety of reasons. But if they're still eating Snickers and processed foods, not great. We're still going to see it in the tissues. We're still still going to have an inflamed animal. It is not a species appropriate diet. Um, the good thing about pigs is that the whole trope of you can you know eat like a pig, you can feed a pig anything sort of thing works. And as long as you get the pig uh, enough protein and energy source that doesn't have linoleic acid, they'll incorporate that into their tissues and then they'll have lower amounts of linoleic acid. So. There's a lot of amazing people trying to do some stuff here. Um, Brad Marshall's played around a little bit, but the best I've seen is from Wildem Farms. Um, they are in Maryland, and they have been using whey and some other sources, corn-free, soy-free, because um, they've been up on this step, type of stuff. And again, farmers are getting wise to what people want and what's, you know, most importantly, most species appropriate for the animal. Animals shouldn't be eating one type of food all of the time indefinitely. They should be getting a variety of food. They should be pigs in specific should be rooting for their food. Um, they shouldn't be on pasture. Pigs should be in the woods. Pigs should be digging up roots and weird things and eating squirrels. Wild and farm is getting 4%, which is the closest I've seen to a species appropriate pig. And like, again, I think that low, low single digits like here, totally fine. Uh, so that would be the aim. If you're going to eat pork for sure, Drive that thing down with the corn-free, soy-free, and try to get, you know, ask your farmer for tests. Ask them about the nutrition. Sometimes they'll feed them other grains that are still super high um, in linoleic acid. So the only way you can really know is testing. But even if say they say, oh, yeah, we give them free choice pea and wheat. Well, you can look that up, and that will likely be a much better option than corn and soy. So. Just be mindful of a lot of people say like, oh yeah, well, if you remove seed oils, then you can just use lard for, for this in, instead. And huge problem. Again, look at the amount of linoleic acid. You'd be probably be better off using canola oil, which is insane. Um, bacon, same thing, almost completely fat. So sorry about that, but get your corn-free, soy-free bacon from Wildum and some other places. Okay, so chicken, same exact thing. So amount of meat, what? we are eating from chicken is going up dramatically over the years. So this is mostly due to the factory farming nature of chicken. It's really easy to grow chicken. We've, we've taken one single breed of chicken. It used to be hundreds and hundreds of species. We now have a couple hatcheries in the entire world, basically, that control the breed of chicken. And we fed them corn and soy to get them as big and fat as fast as possible. And so now we have chickens that instead of take a year plus to get slaughter with these big, enormous industrial operations that take 40 days to get them to slaughter, 46 days, which is insane. So we have this entire industry that is focused on producing the biggest, fattest bird as fast as possible. Uh, that along with the fear of saturated fat and chicken being the white meat. Again, we've gone from species appropriate diet uh, and it was appropriate fat level of 2.5% linoleic acid. Again, same with the pork, same with the human, um, to now a typical conventional linoleic acid amount of over 50%. So again, this was this is some of the worst oils, 50 plus percent. So if you're eating chicken thinking that you're doing some healthy thing by avoiding seed oils, huge, huge issue with chicken being what it's fed. 
Again, chickens are jungle fowl. They should be up in the trees. They should be eating bugs. They should be growing over a long period of time. They should not have as much meat or fat. However, we've bred these chickens to do that. So there's a lot of people who are starting to move to different breeds, freedom rangers, things like that, that get bigger, slower, but again, still feeding them corn and soy. If you don't feed a a Cornish cross, this is like the typical white chicken that you see, even with this model, this is a rooster, but you get it, the... They will essentially die if you don't feed them a surplus of corn and soy over the first six weeks of their life. This is how much we've selectively bred these animals to get fat as fast as possible to prop up the industrial farming community. It is sick and it is crazy and they are sick animals as you see it. Humans, when they have rates of linoleic acid getting in the 20%, get sick. They get, they get sick and the same thing happens with animals. And so you're, if you're eating a sick animal that has all of this linoleic acid in it, why would you not get sick either? Um, pasture raised birds, same thing. They're eating corn and soy all day long. Yes, it's better for sure. It's all this stuff is on a spectrum and you know, there's a variety of reasons not to support conventional agriculture and support, um, pasture raised, but still ask your farmer. There's, there's more and more farmers switching over to corn free, soy free, and more of them will if you ask. So ask them and try to get the feed switched over. It decreases the linoleic acid quite a bit, but still again, at about canola oil levels here, about 10 times what we should be seeing in a species appropriate uh, diet. So I put corn free, soy free linoleic acid here, question marks. Uh, Why is that? Well, it's because I have yet to see a chicken that has been less than 20%, regardless of their corn free, soy free. So they may be out there hopefully they are if anybody knows of any chickens that have been able to test their fatty acids lower than 20 percent on a corn free soy free diet please send me this information i'm super curious about it but you know, again i've seen a couple operations show really good results with pork i've seen nothing on chicken period so the same thing applies for all po- poultry um so a lot of people say like oh gay okay like let's reduce seed oils but use duck fat because duck fat's tasty and it's great Duck fat over 40% linoleic acid. Um, same thing applies for any of these um, birds. So all the birds, same issue, um, not great, really sad. I, I, it's the same thing as what we do with the rest of our food system. We've we've taken it. So people under you know think they're eating this real whole food as a chicken, but again, we've we've bastardized it. The the chicken is now this weird Franken food that is dependent on the corn and soy industry, which is really messed up. So salmon and other fish. Okay. See the same pattern going on here. So when it's human fed, when human humans think that they can feed an animal essentially to get it fat and big as fast as possible so that we we can eat as many of them as possible, bad things happen. So wild salmon goes from 0.6 to 1.2% linoleic acid to times, you know, 10 to 20 times that amount with farm salad, salmon. They're given soybean pellets. It's ridiculous. Their omega-3 levels also plummet. So this that's across the board. We don't cover that here, but there's a lot of other reasons to avoid these farmed fishes. They're given weird dyes. Um, they're giving weird chemicals as saying here. Um, this is from a study talking like, talking about farm salmon. They, they are high in persistent chlorinated contaminants that are known to cause cancer, neurobehavioral dec- decrements in children and reduce memory function in older adults. So they took from the salmon, people who ate these chemicals and all of the problems that led to in adults. Tilapia, same thing over, um, you know, 2.1% linoleic acid. Again, species appropriate. We're saying here, these levels, these low linoleic acid levels, the low single digit percentages are what you want to shoot for. Um, farm tilapia, 13.6. Uh, wild shrimp, 4.5, farm shrimp, uh, 13% plus. Oysters are kind of the ruminant of the sea, and we'll talk about what that means in a second as far as why they're great, but it doesn't even matter if you farm oysters. They're going to have, this is farmed oyster right here, 0.2% of the fatty acids are linoleic acid. Um, so oysters are pretty amazing for a variety of reasons. They filter out, they have this filtering mechanism. You do not get the things that they filter out. They are amazing for um, restoring reefs and for pulling carbon out of the um, water and filtering water, but also are packed with nutrients. Oysters are 
you know, next to liver, probably one of the best foods that humans can eat. So don't fret. There are oysters where you guys can get your seafood and not have to worry about where they come from. Uh, okay. Well, what about other human fed animals? So no need to worry about linoleic acid bioaccumulation in cattle or other ruminants. So ruminants are named that way because they have a rumen that is their, as you see here, their rumen, which is their digestive system that ferments the things that they're eating. So they can eat grass, they can eat grain, they can eat soybeans, they can eat corn, and they'll take all of those fatty acids, all the carbohydrate, all the cellulose, break it down, ferment it, and use that amazing technology that nature developed to make whatever they want. And so with cattle, it's gonna be more saturated fats, but they basically break it down into two, two carbon chains and are easily then building them back up in their own body. Um, and a lot of the times cattle are also fed a lot of food that is not for humans. And so, for example, if we're feeding a pig or a chicken all this corn and soy, they have to eat the whole thing for them to get fat. But they're a monogastric animal, which means only one stomach, not the same with the four stomachs of, you know, the rumen, the reticulum, the omassum, and the uh, bomassum. Um, so they have four stomachs, ruminants have four stomachs, pigs, chickens, humans, monogastric, meaning one stomach. So we cannot break down food like that. So we need to have more of a complete food. But when we eat too much of a complete food, that's not appropriate for us. We start accumulating the fatty acids. We can't break them apart and make them on our own to a large degree. And so we accumulate, if we eat more linoleic acid, we accumulate the linoleic acid. Does not the case with cattle and other ruminants. So for example, here, grass-fed cattle, 2.2% linoleic acid. Again, species appropriate, great. We're looking at this. Most animals, again, should be low to, you know, low single digits linoleic acid. Grain-fed cattle, 2.4%. So again, nothing has changed here. And again, to tie it back to what the animals can actually eat, a lot of times cattle will, will, because they can ferment stuff, are given food waste, you know, parts of wheat, parts of corn, parts of soy that otherwise cannot be digested by monogastric animals. So pork and chicken are being fed by, by soy and corn that could be used to either graze more animals or grow cr other crops for humans. Cattle typically are eating grasses and fields and non-arable land that cannot be used for human consumption. And they eat leftovers of food that typically humans or other animals cannot eat. And so most of the stuff around people saying that, you know, cattle displaces um, a lot of different, you know, food sources, complete lie, complete myth is just absolutely not the case if you look into it. Um, so the same thing goes for other animals that have the same digestive system, sheep, goat, elk, bison, etc. So the big four, four legged things that run around and, and look like they're grazing all day, you can count that they're doing the same thing. So that is not to say that there aren't plenty of reasons to eat regenerative ruminants, you know, an ethical standard, again, biodiversity, soil health, uh, species appropriate diet, ethical reasons. Like there, there's so many other reasons to eat regenerative, but if you're looking just for low linoleic acid, it's not one of them. So if, you know, we can talk about this in a little bit, but there are some reasons why, you know, if you're, if you need to shop on a budget or you're getting animal foods, ruminants are the way to go over pork and chicken. Okay. So turns out that, you know, we looked at in the food system, but these oils and linoleic acid is pervasive everywhere. So not only in our food supply, but it's also in all personal care products. So skincare, makeups, soaps, even the quote unquote, like healthy, clean, better for you, simple ones. You may see here. This is just, I, I literally Googled the first five that came up of like clean, deodorant, clean skin tint, whatever that is, clean, whatever oil. Look at all of the seed oils everywhere. Why do we think that this is normal? So your skin is the most, most absorptive organ in your body. It's the largest organ in your body. And you know, another thing that surprised me early on when we started talking with uh, patients who started talking to people online is that when they remove the amount of linoleic acid that they're consuming, again, not only from seed oils, but from nuts and inflammatory meats as well, 
their sunburns dramatically go off a cliff. So they basically they can't get sunburned. You incorporate these linoleic acid, these really unstable omega-6 fatty acids in your phospholipid membranes, and basically your cells and your skin, when it has exposure to UV radiation, when it has exposure to the sun, hot, hot temperature, et cetera, again, will auto-oxidize and will lead to skin damage, DNA damage. I, I, we don't have a lot of evidence on this yet, but I would predict that within the next 50 to 100 years, we will understand this mechanism of sunburn, skin cancer, et cetera, all this related. It just, it's never made sense to me in the, in the past of why have humans lived outside in the sun in tropical areas for the entirety of the human history, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years of our ancestors, and have never needed sunscreen, never had skin cancer, never had sunburns. Well, I think that this is probably one of the main reasons. Again, I don't want to put this as a panacea as you know, linoleic acid, seed oils are the number one thing, and that's the only thing to focus on. I think there's a variety of reasons why we have these issues, and this is a primary driver. I mean, you look at it from a mechanistic level, it makes sense. So even when you're not eating these things, I think you should be looking at, just, just be a label hawk. Look at all the steps. See where all the seed oils are. Um, because you put it on your skin, I guarantee that you're absorbing it in your skin and incorporating it in your, in your um, tissues. This you, you do not want your skin made of linoleic acid. Yet every single one of these websites will go made with these essential um, linoleic acid oils and these natural oils to help your skin heal. It's literally the exact opposite of what happens. Uh, so I'd recommend highly that you look at these things. There's some good companies right now using tallow, um, coconut, you know, cocoa butter, coconut oil, things like that. Again, more saturated fats make a lot of sense here. Uh, not to mention, you're, you're getting all these weird chemicals. Like, look at all these weird chemicals in most skincare products. Like, that alone should be a reason to stop using these things. But again, even the clean ones that try to make it look like they're doing the right thing, I think are full of seed oils, which would be pro very problematic. So be on the lookout and reduce that. Okay, so what can you do? So I think that the very obvious step here, I mean, the, all this stuff is on a spectrum, right? So if you're looking at it from foods that are you know worst for you in terms of linoleic acid component, also provide the least amount of nutrition, seed oils literally provide zero nutrition. They provide the highest amount of inflammatory fats and they are the most processed foods that are also supporting enormous destructive monocrops and huge corporations that don't give a shit about you as a human being. So I think it's very clear that these foods like seed oils, I'm, again, very biased, but I think that those are the things to avoid, the obvious ones to make a huge swing at. I sort of believe like getting the foundations down, like if you're, if you're avoiding a little bit of nuts but still eating a massive amount of, of seed oils, it doesn't really matter. So and, until you get through the step of removing seed oils from where you're eating them via the, the just the cooking oil themselves, mayos, uh, salad dressings, packaged foods, plant-based foods. Again, the restaurant thing is huge. Um, I typically, when I go into a restaurant, say I have a food sensitivity to oils. If you say allergic, they'll freak out and they'll be scared to serve you or anything. But you say a sensitivity, they're used to people talking about gluten, et cetera. And this is where I have hope. I think if people start asking for this, it'll become more commonplace. It's difficult now to be able to go to a restaurant and do it. Uh, but could you imagine 20 years going and asking for gluten-free anywhere? People will look at you like you're crazy. Like, what the hell is gluten? They would say. And with enough education, things change. And I think that the same thing should happen here. And so while most restaurants can cater to it, it, it can be, it can be really challenging. Um, so ask if they can use uh, butter. And if you're in a, you know, in the U S and Europe, it's, it's typically as butter, but a lot of times I've seen in other countries that it'll actually be margarine. Um, so again, caveat there, I've been annoying and asked for the, to, them to bring the olive oil out for them to bring the, the butter out so I can see the label. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is, I think again, again, when, when you're dealing with the fact that linoleic acid sticks in your tissues for two years, if you just go, Oh, screw it. I'm out to eat. It's not a big deal. If you eat like, for example, a Thai food is one of the worst offenders. We saw this when we were in Thailand, um, for a company retreat, looking at a, a cooking class, whereas some of the old school places still make like 
you know, a curry with, and they'll use like a cup of coconut oil. Well, almost even in Thailand, but obviously in the United States, you're getting cups, literal cups of vegetable oils in your food. Insane. Um, so obviously I think that's a huge issue. So just be mindful of that. Any sort of sauce, any sort of dressing, like anything that you can't see, anything that looks like it has any sort of fat on it or in it will have seed oils in it in a restaurant. So I think that's probably the most important thing. On top of that, fryers, when you heat these fats over and over and over again, that actually leads to the most amount of damage, the most amount of these toxic metabolites. And that is that is where you should be avoiding it. So all this data around fried food being bad for you is, is true, but it's not because the food is fried. It's not because of fat. It's because you're frying it with these super unhealthy, unstable fats. And so if you want to have fried food and you can get somebody to use tallow or coconut oil or any of these other super stable oils, great. Fried food is actually totally fine. Uh, there's no problem with it, but frying with oils repeatedly is the biggest issue. Um, and then we're talking about the seasonal hibernation foods. So if you're going to eat nuts, seeds, and grains, just do so seasonally and understand that they're hibernation foods. And so eating handfuls of these things, again, think about the fat squirrel. Uh, th- think about what you're doing to, to, to inside your body and you're accumulating these things for a long period of time. So if you're going to eat nuts and then not eat nuts for nine months or 11 months, probably not that big of a deal. If you're going to have a little bit of them, again, in the con- in context of your entire fat picture, fat consumption, not a big deal. Um, so the, the animal products, again, the human fed animal animals. So the animals just, just think about, is the animal getting a species appropriate diet? Uh, if you can't afford the highest quality regenerative meat, grass fed meat, I know that it can be hard for people. It can be hard to access. It can be really expensive. So if that's the case for you and you're facing a, you know, a budget and you're at a conventional grocery store, um, the beef or other ruminants by far a better at option than the pork or the chicken. Um, if you're, if you're buying locally from a farmer, you have the availability to do that. It's amazing. Um, if you're trying to find a, a local farmer, go to, um, groundworkcollective.com. I put together actually a little resource. People can find local farms there. Um, and ask for the corn free, soy free. Same thing with the gluten at restaurants. When it start, this starts and you'll feel like the crazy outsider, but if more of us ask, more of the farmers will do it. I think it, you know, tide is shifting. So be the strong one for us. Go ask your farmer, have them switch to corn free, soy free, ask for the fatty acid profiles. If they don't have them, ask for the diet. Go ahead and Google linoleic acid percentage of whatever they say they're feeding them. Uh, and that'd be great. Uh, the other bonus, eliminate the seed oils from personal care products. So that again is going to incorporate your skin and auto oxidize lead to likely uh, sunburns and you know hopefully not skin cancer, but I could see how that link would make sense. And just try to remember that th- this along with all other nutrition sort of recommendations and things like that should not live in a vacuum. So don't think that, okay, if I eat no linoleic acid, I'm going to magically be healthy. I think it's a step in the right direction, but you know, technically, um, Snickers and Butterfingers, for example, are low in linoleic acid. That does not mean that they are healthy foods. So you need to look in context of an actual human diet, what species appropriate and, try to not lose this stuff in the grand scheme of health. Uh, it's really important. I think that that people really drill in and find out what works for them. Your goals may be different than other people, but I think we can all agree that eating 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 40 times the amount of species appropriate linoleic acid, things are likely to break. So just keep that in mind and try to make this a part of a, a healthy, balanced approach to fit your individual needs. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. If you guys want to learn more about this stuff, I have a podcast where I actually dive into a lot of these topics called the natural state I have a newsletter called the feed, which you can go to dranthonygusson.com slash the feed, where I write about a lot of this stuff, post research, my own findings. You can find me on social media everywhere at dranthonygusson. My website's the same. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at any point through any of these channels, either the contact form on my website or just shoot me a DM on Twitter or Instagram, and I'm happy to get back to you and 
again, send you the slides if you guys are interested in any of the stuff here to look through the, re the references. Um, and, and honestly, people are asking a lot of really great questions and it's gonna help us to know what you guys have questions with after this conference. So that way we can answer them and, and continue to provide value for everybody else. So thanks for tuning in and hope you guys enjoyed and we'll see you soon.